Welcome back. I'm always delighted to be able to say welcome to a good friend uh, and valued colleague, a man that uh, I've come to admire tremendously for his strategic thinking, um, his knowledge and uh, the ability to communicate it all, both at his blog, uh, jrnyquist.blog, and in his various writings, um, among other places at the Epic Times, and of course, uh, in book form, um, notably the origins of the Fourth World War, a particularly salient topic at the moment. His name, again, is Jeff Nyquist. We're always delighted to have him with us. Good to have you again today. Jeff, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Let's talk a little bit about um, one likely challenge we face in a new world war, and that is from communist China. Uh, as you know very well, we've been at war for some time with the Chinese. Uh, they call it unrestricted warfare. They've actually declared it in the pages of the People's Daily as people's war. Um, most of us are unaware that it's happening, let alone the various manifestations of that warfare. But we're all aware of one manifestation, and that is what I think of as a biological weapons attack using COVID-19, uh, the so-called SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, this brought us to reflecting on some of your previous writings about the background to and uh, seeming plans for biological warfare of the Chinese Communist Party. Walk us through what we know uh, about all that at this point and what we can surmise from what we've been subjected to of late. Well, when you talk to Chinese who are familiar with documents that have been smuggled out of uh, communist China from the Communist Party, there is one in particular. It's the secret speech of Chiao Chen, which uh, took place uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, and who was and it was translated. What's who that? Was Chiao Chen? Chiao Chen was the defense minister of China, and he was a general. Uh, he was a strategist, a leading Chinese strategist, and he was on the, the party military commission. Um, and at the time of his speech, this, he was in that role as defense He was minister. defense minister, yeah. yes. Uh, general Chiao Chen's speech, uh, he, he gave several in that period about the opening of the Chinese century and so on. But this speech was to an elite group of party cadre, top Communist Party officials, describing their strategy of how to deal with the problem of America. And of course, the problem of America is that China needs our land because China uh, does not have enough land to support its people indefinitely. The land is being polluted. Uh, the rivers are polluted. Uh, the Chinese people are also facing economic problems uh, due to things related to this. And therefore, and population uh, is issues, of course, population pressures. Yeah. He said that the Communist Party can only justify its existence by teaching the Chinese people how to go out mm. outside of China and find new land. And he, he talks this about sounds China, eerily you know, reminiscent and, to the old Hilarion Lebensraum, doesn't it? Well, ac yeah, actually, he mentions Hitler in the speech and he talks about Lebensraum and he says, look, we can't talk about Lebensraum or living space because then we'll sound like Hitler and then we'll be, you know, described as Nazis. So he's very aware of how the outside world would see this. So it's a sensitive topic. Mm -hmm. um, and then he, he starts talking about, well, will we find land in India or Taiwan or wherever? And he said it's all trivial because anywhere they look for land, the Americans will be against them. And so, but it happens that the Americans have the land they want, the best farmland in the estate. world. And he said, mm -hmm. right. So if we have to fight America anyway, no matter who we try to take land from, it might as well be the Americans' land. Mm -hmm. And so he sort of resolves this problem in this this formula that he puts forward, that uh, it's them or us. The Americans are standing in our way, so we might as well make it about America. Mm -hmm. And they have what we want. And the issue that I'm particularly concerned about, Jeff, and, and I've learned a lot from you on this subject, is they have an appreciation that if they want to get the land and have it be usable, for agricultural purposes or production of other things, they can't destroy it. They can't irradiate it. 
um, which would be, of course, the practical effect of uh, a nuclear attack against this country. How have they resolved that particular problem, at least at a doctrinal well, level? Xi said that in challenging the U.S., there was always the danger of a nuclear war. But in that case, you know, China loses seven, eight hundred million people and problem solved. But the the real way they ought to try to solve the problem is by killing 100 to 200 million Americans and causing American society to collapse through a biological attack. And that would have the upside of getting rid of the population that they don't want, um, enabling, I guess, the remaining population to be enslaved, but not despoiling the land, not precluding its use by the Chinese. And to the extent that we know much about this biological warfare program, um, we've certainly been focusing more attention on it in the hindsight of uh, what we believe is a virus emanating from one of its laboratories. But Give us a sense of the extent to which this program, which as I understand it was actually put in train by Deng Xiaoping back in the early 1990s. How far advanced is it? Is it capable of meeting the kind of uh, ambitious needs that you've just described? Well, all the scientific uh, uh, studies, all the scientific laboratories and schools in China have reached out over the last 20 plus years to the West, uh, scientific exchanges. They're involved with India, the U.S., Europe. They're uh, they're gathering information, and they they st- actually steal from the labs mm-hmm. in the West. They steal organisms. Even they got caught doing that in Canada not long ago, and and of course the 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 uh, the scientific exchanges where they go into, uh, uh, for example, uh, Emory. Uh, that feeds the CDC. They get involved in, uh, uh, look, a large percentage, up to 50% in our government labs are Chinese nationals. That's unbelievable. Right? Which is kind of a shock to me when I found that out. And they also supply 50% of our active pharmaceutical ingredients for our pharmaceutical industry. And they've done this over the last 22 or so years Mm -hmm. intentionally as part of this program. Because not only getting the positions in our own system and connections with far, big pharma, is are these are attack vectors, yes. but also getting the science, mm-hmm. uh, working with our scientists, gain of learning how research, to do genes, for example. Yes, gain of function resource research. Look, it's very funny. We we find gain of function research is dangerous. We don't want people doing it here, so people outsource it to China. Well, this is the perfect thing for China. Right. It's absolutely the perfect thing for them because then they can take this, uh, and they can make make a weapon, and they can actually then blame it on us. Right. And have in the case of uh, COVID, of course. Um, and Jeff, it's important to recall that. Uh, in accordance with the Biological Warfare Convention to which China is a party, they're not supposed to have any biological warfare program at all. I mean, you can do defensive work, yes, but but not in terms of offensive. And one of the things that has come to my attention is an, uh, sort of a, um, it's of a piece with what you said about their deep penetration of our research institutions and laboratories. They've essentially melded with their military, all of their so-called civilian pharmaceutical and uh, research institutions and and any other uh, businesses, I understand it, that could conceivably provide help to their biological warfare program. Is, is that your understanding as well? Oh, yes. They'll steal everything that isn't nailed down. We know about their intellectual property theft. I mean, stealing scientific data is extremely you know, in their lane, this is what they do. But, but in addition, there's this so-called civil military fusion in which their own, their oh, own yes. capabilities are sort of uh, a whole of society operation aimed at uh, right. A- every purposes. business, every business in China, uh, whatever it is, has a military or strategic in importance of some kind, yes. whether it's transportation or communications or every branch of science, nuclear, medicine. Um, you know, economics, every single branch of science. In fact, this is the way both China and Russia organize themselves. They have institutes that do nothing but study, but they always study this in the context of what is the strategic meaning? How can we exploit this? 
Yeah. Right. And, and uh, you know, there's so many applications of that uh, beyond the biological um, space uh, comes to mind particularly. But the, the biological warfare aspect of this, I have to say, especially in the wake of what we have been subjected to, and not just the United States, of course, but the entire world, as Gordon Chang has said on this program and elsewhere, uh, you know, this is the first time any country in the world has attacked all of the rest of them simultaneously. And, and uh, is it your view? And very quickly, we've got 30 seconds here, Jeff. Was it a biological warfare attack or was it simply that they took advantage as a proof of concept or maybe even a dress rehearsal of a, an accidental leak? Well, we don't know, but if it was an accidental leak, they certainly then turned it into an attack yes. by the way they behaved. Spreading it worldwide by sending millions of people from Wuhan once they knew that that was the locus of this disease uh, all over the world. Jeff, I have to leave it at that for the moment. I did want to wish you a happy birthday, as well as, I guess, oh, thank a you. notorious person who also shares that distinction. Karl Marx, for heaven's sakes. I can't imagine yeah. two more polar opposites, but uh, we appreciate your work so much uh, in countering the effects of Marxism, whether it's from the Chinese or the Russians or others. And uh, I know you'll keep up the good work and we look forward to talking with you again very soon. We're going to continue our conversation about what the Chinese are up to in the way of unrestricted warfare with our next guest, Kevin Freeman, our expert on economic warfare and how you may be underwriting the China threat. Right ahead.